and good evening church. Good to see you here tonight. Welcome to Washington Avenue Church of Christ. Tonight is our singing service, our song service, in which we are going to put a greater emphasis on the number of songs that we sing tonight. We still will have prayers and Lord's Supper and contributions and sermons and such, but tonight we're going to take joy in worshiping of God through songs. We'll begin, first three songs will be George Wonderlick, and then we'll have Caleb Sills lead us in our uh, opening prayer. Jim Hall will lead three, Jerry Johnson will lead three, Andrew Rogers will lead one before I give the lesson, and then Andrew will close us out with the invitation song um, and the closing song. This is a fine opportunity to be able to sing out. As always, I ask the song leaders, pick songs you enjoy and bring that enthusiasm, your love for what the words mean and your love for um, what this is and whether it's a praise song or it's a scripture song, whether it's something describing the Christian experience, bring that enthusiasm or the, the reality to it in the way that you sing. It is a privilege to be able to worship God uh, in this way. Uh, there's nothing like it and it's something that we do together. So enjoy worshiping God together. What a blessing. George? Number 417 is our first song, 417, Where He Leads, I'll Follow. 417, we'll sing all three verses, please. <clears throat> Sweet are the promises, kind is the word, dearer far than any message man ever heard. Pure was the mind of Christ, sinless I see, he the great example is a pattern. Boundless 
67, we have an anchor. <clears throat> I don't know if we sing this song very much or not. It's an old one, I think, so hopefully we'll know this. And uh, it's a very fitting song as we live life. So I hope we'll pay attention to the words. Let's stand as we sing this song, please. <clears throat> <clears throat> Will your anchor hold in the storms of life when the clouds unfold their wings of sky? bow with me please lord thank you for this day and thank you for everything you've blessed us with lord thank you for the being so good to us and being a great example and please help us to do what you want us to do tonight lord and please please help us to apply the teachings that are being brought to us this evening and help us to listen to the songs that are being sung as well and please help us to spread your gospel and meditate on what you said in the bible lord and Lord, most of all, I thank you for sending your son to die on the cross for us, for the remission of our sins. It's a debt we can never pay, Lord. And I pray in Christ's name, amen. Next song this evening will be number 869, if you're using your songbooks, number 869. We're marching to Zion. We'll be singing all four verses. Come we that love the Lord and let our joys be known. Join in a song with sweet accord. Join in a song with sweet accord. And thus surround the throne and thus surround the throne. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion. The beautiful city of God. Let those refuse to sing who never knew a God. But children of the heavenly King, but children of the heavenly King, may speak their joys abroad, may speak their joys abroad. We're marching to Zion. Beautiful, beautiful 
Zion, we're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. The hill of Zion yields a thousand sacred sweets. Before we reach the heavenly fields, before we reach the heavenly fields, or walk the golden streets to walk the golden streets. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Then let our songs abound and every tear be dry. We're marching through Emmanuel's ground. We're marching through Emmanuel's ground to fairer worlds on high, to fairer worlds on high. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. The next song this evening is going to be on PowerPoint only. It is, I Feel Like Traveling On. Nod your head if you know this song. Shake your head if you don't know this song. If you nodded your head, please sing out with me. This is an older song, um, and it is a very simple song. It's not difficult to follow, but if you will, please sing out if you do know it. And uh, hopefully, if you're not familiar with it, this will be a song you'll like to learn. My heavenly home is bright and fair, I feel like traveling on. No pain nor death can enter there, I feel like traveling on. Yes, I feel like traveling on, I feel like traveling on. My heavenly home is Right and fair, I feel like traveling on. Its glittering towers, the sun outshine, I feel like traveling on. That heavenly mansion shall be mine, I feel like traveling on. Yes, I feel like traveling on. I feel like traveling on. My heavenly home is bright and fair. I feel like traveling on. Let others seek a home below. I feel like traveling on. Which flames devour or waves or flow. I feel traveling on. Yes, I feel like traveling on. I feel like traveling on. My heavenly home is bright and fair. I feel like traveling on. The Lord has been so good to me. I feel like traveling on. Yes, I feel like traveling on, I feel like traveling on. My heavenly home is bright and fair, I feel like traveling on. My last song this evening, before Jerry gets up here, is going to be number 189. Number 189, Master of the Tempest is Raging. (laughs) 
Master, the tempest is raging, the billows are tossing high. The sky is o'ershadowed with blackness, no shelter or help is nigh. Carest thou not that we perish? How canst thou lie asleep? When each moment so madly is threatening a grave in the angry deep, the winds and the waves shall obey thy will. Peace be still. Whether the wrath of the storm tossed sea, or demons, or men, or whatever it be, no water can swallow the ship where it lies, the master of ocean and earth and skies. They all shall sweetly obey thy will. Peace be still, peace be still. They all shall sweetly obey thy will. Peace, peace, be still. Master, with anguish of spirit, I bow in my grief today. The depths of my sad heart are troubled. Awaken and save, I pray. Torrents of sin and of anguish sweep o'er my sinking soul. And I perish, I perish, dear Master. Oh, hasten and take control. The winds and the waves shall obey thy will. Peace be still. Whether the wrath of the storm tossed sea, or demons, or men, or whatever it be, no water can swallow the ship where it lies, the master of ocean and earth and skies. They all shall sweetly obey thy will. They all shall sweetly obey thy will. Peace, peace, be still. Master, the timber is over, the elements sweetly rest. Earth's sun in the calm lake is mirrored, and heaven's within my breast. Linger, O oh blessed Redeemer, leave me alone no more. And with joy I shall make the blessed harbor and rest on the blissful shore. The winds and the waves shall obey thy will. Peace be still. Whether the wrath of the storm toss sea or demons or men or whatever it be, no water can swallow the ship where it lies, the master of ocean and earth and skies. They all shall sweetly obey thy will. Peace be still, peace be still. They all shall sweetly obey thy will. Peace, peace, be still. I say good evening, everyone. Our first selection, my first selection, is 528. <clears throat> In your hymn books, 528. We're going to sing all four verses. I'm going to try to sing all four verses. I know that my Redeemer lives and never prays for me. I know eternal life he gives from sin and sorrow free. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know, I know eternal life he gives. I know should wholly be in word and thought. 
been dead. Then I, his holy face, may see when from this earth fly free. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know, I know eternal life he gives. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know that unto sinful men his saving grace is not. I know that he will come again to take me home on high. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know, I know eternal life he gives. I know. Stands a place prepared for me. A home, a house not made with hand, most wonderful to see. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know, I know eternal life he gives. I know. Thank you for singing, singing out. Next selection is hymn 300. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Sing, O oh, earth, his wonderful love proclaim. Hail him, hail him, highest our angels in glory. Strength and honor give to his holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard his children. In his arms, he carries them all day long. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. For our sins He suffered and bled and died. He our rock, our hope of eternal salvation. Hail Him, hail Him, Jesus the crucified. Praise Him, Jesus who bore our sorrow. Love unbounded, wonderful, deep, and strong. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Heavenly portal, flower those annals ring. Jesus, Savior, reigneth forever and ever. Crown him, crown him, prophet and priest and king. Christ is coming over the world victorious. Power and glory unto the Lord belong. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. Hymn 472. 472. And if you would, would you please stand with me? Shelter in this time of storm. I don't know if some of you are like me, but anytime you get busy, you get sweaty. <laughs> <All right. clears throat> 
The Lord's our rock, in him we hide, a shelter in the time of storm. Secure wherever ill be time, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh Lord, oh Lord, oh Jesus is a rock in the weary, you know a weary, yes a weary lamb. My Jesus is a rock in the weary, for he's a shelter in the time of storm. A shade by day, defense by night, a shelter in the time of storm. No fears along, no foes of fright, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh Lord, oh Lord, oh Jesus is a rock in a weary You know a weary, yes, a weary land. My Jesus is a rock in a weary for he's a shelter in the time of storm. The raging storms may round us be, a shelter in the time of storm. We'll never leave our safe retreat, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh Lord, oh Lord, oh Jesus is a rock in a weary You know a weary yes, a weary Jesus is a rock in a weary, for he's a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, rock divine, oh, refuge dear, a shelter in the time of storm. Be thou our helper ever near, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord, oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary. You know a weary, yes, a weary land. My Jesus is a rock in a weary land. For he's a shelter in the time of storm. You may be seated. I don't know whose idea was to put me after Jerry, but I'm mad with him. You want my song? You can just have it. Like I, it's all you. Um, before uh, the lesson, we'll do Hallelujah, Praise Jehovah. Mm. Hallelujah, praise Jehovah. From the heavens, praise his name. Praise Jehovah in the highest. All his angels. Far above the earth and sky, all 
ye fruitful trees and cedars, all ye hills and mountains high, creeping things and beasts and cattle, birds that in the heavens fly, kings of earth and all ye peoples, princes, greatest judges all. Praise his name, young men and maidens, aged men and children small. Let them praises give Jehovah, for his name alone is high. And his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted, and his glory far above the earth and sky. Amen. I asked Andrew, you know, in the notations there on the PowerPoint, it doesn't give it in the chorus, but if you see it in the books, it'll have those parts where it says pianissimo and uh, mezzo forte and then fortissimo and telling you to get really, really soft, get really, really loud. And it's like, Will they do it tonight? Can you lead them to do that? And success. When you write those songs, you, you sing them out with your heart. Man, it makes all the difference. And praise to God for that. Uh, there's nothing like singing, uh, especially together uh, as Christians. And when you know that the purpose of your singing is to glorify God, there's no greater purpose. What a glorious thing. We're blessed to have really great song leaders. And we're blessed to have people who care so much about the way that they worship God. And I'm thankful for it. Tonight, let's talk about wisdom. Proverbs chapter 25 starts off with this really interesting verse. We're going to read verses 1 through 5. We'll come back to verse 1, and we're going to talk about wisdom a little bit. Uh, wisdom's an incredible thing. Uh, it used to be when I was younger that I appreciated knowledge tremendously. Because when you're young, you're a sponge for knowledge. You just eat up the facts. And to me, at that point, you, like, you, you, you couldn't be more excited to learn something. That's one of the reasons I love when little kids, they'll learn something, they'll tell it to you like it's the first time it's ever been discovered in all of humanity. David, did you know that great white sharks can be 20 feet? Uh, wow, you can't say, yes, you stupid child. You would never say something like that. They're so excited about it, and why not? The world is full of exciting and new things that you've just got to have that thirst for knowledge. And while knowledge is fun and exciting and there's all kinds of wild facts out there in the world, wisdom, wisdom is really something special. It's where you take those and you put them to play in life, especially the points in life where it all matters, where life matters, where it's meaningful, where it's true, where it's right. That's wisdom. There's a greater value for wisdom. I think I hope I'm learning that to a greater degree uh, as I age and get more experience, the value of both. But man, wisdom, something special. I'll tell you one of the things of wisdom that was given to me when I was younger, and you may think about some bit of wisdom that was given to you. Uh, maybe that you had to wrestle with it sometime. I remember we had lots of people on the, the mountain. One, Raleigh McIntosh was one in particular, lived out the ridge. And he would, you know, always give us stuff and encourage us. Uh, sort of that wise old guy out at the end of the ridge, ran an orchard. <coughs> one of the things we got from Raleigh, because he enjoyed it so much, even as he was much older, he's like, never stop being a student. Never stop being a student. Sounded crazy at 16, at 17. Never stop being a student. No, man, I enjoy school and I do enjoy learning, but there's got to be a time. I'm not a student anymore because you got to move on. But he's like, nope, never stop being a student. Sounded kind of crazy at first, but as you get older, you realize, oh, yeah, why would I stop? There's so much to learn and so many ways to apply it. Never stop being a student. It keeps you humble because you never know it all. It keeps you humble because you never sit there and go, yeah, I'm the smartest person in the room. Probably not. It's probably somebody else in there because they never stopped being a student. And you learn to appreciate those people, sit at their feet and say, please teach me your ways. It keeps you humble. It keeps you focused on God, especially God who gave us his word, which is so rich and so full of wisdom and knowledge. But wisdom, it's in there. That's why we start Proverbs chapter 25. And when we read <coughs> these <laughs> five verses, I want you to pay attention to the first 
There's a tone to the first verse of this that shows a deep generational generational appreciation for wisdom that comes from God. Of course, Proverbs was written by Solomon. Of course, Solomon was that one king, didn't live a perfect life, didn't always use his wisdom. But when God asked him for the one thing that he wanted, that God would give him, <coughs> give him 1 Kings chapter 3, he said, wisdom, the ability to <laughs> to discern what is right and what is wrong, the ability to be a king who knows how to lead his people. Wisdom, that's what he asked God. And man, God gave him so much. We benefit from the Proverbs because this is him writing it down and, and numerous things. This is what he says in chapter 25, verse one. These also are Proverbs of Solomon, which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied. We'll come back to that. It is the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the glory of kings is to search out a matter. As the heavens for height and the earth for depth, so the heart of a king is unsearchable. Verse 4, take away the dross from silver, and it will go to the silversmith for jewelry. Take away the wicked from before the king, and his throne will be established in righteousness. I love that first verse. King Hezekiah, you can read about in 2 Chronicles chapter 29. His father was a wicked, wicked man who did not obey God. His son, problem as well. But King Hezekiah centered and grounded himself in truth and in knowledge, but wisdom. If he was the guy that was going to be the king, a true king, a right king to follow in the footsteps of his father, David, and lead his people in the discernment of good and evil in a way that was to pursue God, had to have wisdom and he had to put God first. If you read 2 Chronicles chapter 29, you will see one of the first things that he did was to put his kingdom in order before the Lord. And to do that, his focus was first on the temple, the place where they worship God, the place where they put emphasis on God. If you were going to be a person who lived in wisdom and obeyed God, put the things of God first in your life. There's people that may have said, oh, if you're going to be a good king, first get your economics in place, first get your military in place. But he knew in wisdom, true wisdom, godly wisdom, put God in his place, which is first. Everything else will go where it needs to go. God goes first. And so he did that. And man, he made some wise choices. And when the Assyrian king uh, Sennacherib came in to assault him and batter his kingdom and take him over as he had done to so many, in wisdom he went to God. He went to God's prophets. He didn't lean on his own understanding. He didn't lean on his own armies. He leaned on God. And God delivered. God delivered. One angel, angel of the Lord, wiped out 185,000 soldiers. You may think you are powerful in this world, but you are not compared to God. You may think you are wise in this world, but you are not compared to the wisdom of God. Put God in his place and you will be blessed. The men of Hezekiah, chapter 25, verse 1 of Proverbs, the men of Hezekiah, generations and generations after Solomon, knew wisdom was of such a value that it tells us that they took the time and the effort to copy down the wisdom. It's so valuable that you must copy it down and understand this is nothing like what we have today. If you want to copy some document down, it takes almost no effort whatsoever. How many times have you said, hey, Siri, I can't say it loud because she'll start talking. Hey, Siri, write this down for me. Hey, send me a message. You just talk and he writes it down. And you know, even better than that, even easier than this, old documents that we have, we can now scan them into our copier and ask it to convert that over to edible text. How amazing is that? You can have so many things done so fast on a computer now that it's really hard to fathom. They didn't have it. If they wanted <coughs> to copy a document down, you had to have a scribe or someone who was quite skilled in writing on particular kinds of paper. P perhaps it was papyrus, but papyrus is tricky. It's got a very, a very thick texture to it, and you can't make curves easily on papyrus. And so a lot of the writing might be quite angular to it. and It requires some skill and experience in doing that, but you have to be very careful with the inks. If you make a mistake, you can't backspace. You can't select all, delete, and start over. You can't copy and paste. You get another piece of papyrus. It's pretty expensive. It has to be handmade. And you start all over. Or you scribble and look. Okay. Oh, man, Siri, you did it anyway. She literally just dictated everything I said. Bad, Siri, bad. 
but <laughs> you had to go through a whole process. If it was vellum, if you used vellum, that's animal skins. That means you had to kill a goat, usually a goat, and you would tan its hide, and that would make a smoother, more durable thing, but it required so much effort. And then painstaking care <laughs> and passion to go to the details to, <coughs> to make sure you get it right. They <coughs> valued <coughs> the wisdom of Solomon to such a degree that they gave the time for it. It had to be not just respected and not just cared for as a knowledge-based thing, but this is the wisdom of God. And God's wisdom changes lives, utterly changes lives, if you're smart enough to follow it. Some of it's fantastic. Chapter 3, verses 5 and 6 is one of the most popular all of, uh, 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 <coughs> of the Proverbs. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. If you're looking for a verse to memorize this week, that's a good two to start with. You may already know it. It's a pretty <coughs> popular word. But if you're smart and have knowledge, you'll memorize it. <coughs> you'll study it. You'll know what it says. If you are wise, you will obey. You will sit and meditate. You will think about the ways that you do already trust in the Lord that have been a blessing and a benefit to you. But you might search out and go, look, I'm a student always. What are places in my life that I have restricted? Maybe not even consciously, but what are ways in my life that I have closed off to God? Which means, what are ways in my life that I can open up more towards God? Have I invited God into my finances? Have I invited God into my relationships? Have I invited God into my struggles? Have I invited God into the, the way that I engage with entertainment? Have I invited God into the way that I interact on social media? Have I invited God into every single aspect of my life? Or do I try to compartmentalize him and find an excuse not to engage him in my life? Wisdom says, let's open our lives completely and utterly to God. We're not partially Christian. We're fully Christian. He must be in everything that we do and lead us in all aspects of that by his wisdom. Lean not on our own understanding. In all our ways acknowledge him. and He shall direct your paths. Man, that's powerful. And even challenging things that he, he gives. Uh, like, for example, chapter 19 in verse 21, he's given a, a thought there in wisdom. There's Obviously, it's full of them. There are many plans in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the Lord's counsel, that will stand. Fantastic. Chapter 20, verse 1. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is a brawler. And whoever is led astray by it is not wise. It's just not wise. You may think to points in your life where you've seen these things play out. I don't think that's to any particular geography or location or culture or socioeconomic class. If you've seen people engage in strong drink, you've seen the consequences of it. People that may be so, so kind in one minute turn to ultra violent and angry the next. People that you thought were the most wonderful person in the world becomes a liar and will turn on you and a thief in the next. There's dire things that have been involved. I have seen it myself. And again, it didn't matter the geography, it didn't matter the background, it didn't matter the socioeconomic class. Wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler, and whoever, no matter where they're from, is led astray by it, is not wise. This is a thing to know, this is a thing to recognize, this is a thing you might observe. But in wisdom, you would look at that and say, I will have nothing to do with it. That's God's wisdom. Tricky in a world that elevates it to such a high place. Chapter 27, verse 2, let another man praise you and not your own mouth, a stranger and not your own lips. Do you know how counter that is to the modern world? Don't praise yourself. Let somebody else do it. You know, when we were in New York, there's a couple of things I kept saying. New York is a place of trust. You must trust that things aren't going to go bad with nine million people crowded together. New York is a place of trust, for sure. And we kind of made that joke going on. But the other thing is, New York is a place of photography, of people taking pictures of themselves. It was amazing. You expect it every now and then. You would see a couple people just post the camera there, and you're like, oh, man, it's really happening. You know it happens, but to see it is a whole other beast. And then they would... Maybe not that good, but they were really good. I'll give them credit. And you're like, what is happening? But there was one particular street down next to the, the library, adjacent to Bryant Park, sun was setting. And you walk down the street, because we were curving around, getting ready to go back up. 
And there was one person out in the street posing for the picture, second pose, great. Walk 10 more feet, next person posing, thing. Walk 10 more feet, yet another person. I think we saw four or five people posing. No shame, no, like, I can't imagine. I hate getting my picture taken so much. It was like, why would you do this? But you're in the midst of it, in a sense. And of course, the popular thing to do is to do that in a way to praise yourself and promote yourself in the most idyllic way possible. But the Bible says, let another man praise you, not your own mouth, a stranger, and not your own lips. Man, there's wisdom in that. Stay humble, stay humble. Value humility over those sort of mad dashes to get the most likes or the most praise that has no real value in and of itself. It's a false way of building yourself up that will collapse over nothing. There's no foundation built in that. Paul knew the value of wisdom, of course, in his conversion. God had a purpose for him. In Acts chapter 26, I know we're making it sounds like a hard turn here, but I want you to see wisdom in action and how it functioned in an everyday life. In Acts chapter 26, he's being brought before Festus and King Agrippa, and they're trying to sort out kind of what's going on here, and he's explaining to them his conversion. I believe this is his third time in which his conversion is explained. Each one carries a little bit of extra detail, so they're definitely worth reading, and so uh, chapters 9, 16, and here in 26. And in this one point, it ends with the fact that they're sort of amazed that he's brought before them in this way, and they find no fault with him to accuse him. So he's teaching truth in this. But what they say to each other is this. This man, last verse 32, this man might have been set free if he had not <coughs> appealed to Caesar. You see, from a, a worldly perspective, the way they're <coughs> viewing things, the real value and the real intent here should have been his, his freedom from where he was at. They were viewing this as like, Paul, if you really wanted to be wise in the midst of this, you would have said the things that would cause us to let you go back and, uh, about your business. But what they did not hear was what he was speaking about earlier in his conversion. What they did not hear and perceive in wisdom <coughs> that his purpose was being fulfilled by being there at that moment and making that appeal to go to Rome so that he could fulfill what God, what God had asked him to do. See, Paul was living not just in knowledge and worldly desires, but what God desired for him to do. And it might have been difficult, but he was going to do it. When Jesus talks to him, as he recounts in verse 15, Jesus says, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles, to whom I now send you. Why? To open their eyes, in order to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. You see, his purpose, which he knew in fact, Jesus spoke to him, he had knowledge of it, but what he knew in wisdom was to follow and fulfill the things that God wanted him to do. They may not make sense from a worldly perspective of wisdom, even amongst kings and learned men. You should be saying things that get you out of this, Paul. But Paul knew if he was truly a man of God, he would follow through with all <coughs> that God had laid out for him, which means he would be proclaiming the truth, yes to the people, but also yes to the kings. And even if it meant all the way to Caesar, God's word would be preached with truth and in reason, and he would extend the gospel to every person. They choose to listen or not listen, but he's doing exactly what God wanted him to do. And exactly how God said he would look out for him, wisdom. That's real wisdom on a day-to-day -day basis. To proclaim God's truth. To give reason for why we believe in God. To give reason for the faith. To let people know that their lives don't have to remain uh, on the path that the world dictates for them. But there is freedom to be found in God. There is hope to be found in God. There is mercy. There is peace. There is something so much greater than what the world has to offer because that will all fade away. But heaven will not. God's truths will not. And your soul, your soul, if you are faithful and obey, and wise, wise in God's path, will live on in eternity in God's kingdom. Wow transformative.
<coughs> Unfortunately, if you've been reading or if you know the story, you know that Agrippa doesn't fully grasp it. Paul tells him, King Agrippa, in verse 27, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. And Paul says, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me today might become both almost and altogether such as I am, except for these chains. Man, that is passion for your purpose in the wisdom and knowledge of God. My prayer is that that, that's what we esteem and aspire to have, not for our own self-aggrandizement, but for God's glory. That's the drive I hope that we, we struggle for, that we, we put the effort in, not for our own uh, self-promotion, not so that we can say, look how great we are, but look how great God is, and look what he offers every person, every person. It's a wonderful life. We are absolutely, truly blessed. We really, really are. It's a wonderful God that loves us and cares for us and watches out for us and gives us his wisdom. Let's spend time in it. Let's meditate it. Let's, let's go into the Proverbs. Let's go into these stories and not look at them as just facts, but wisdom to draw closer to God. That's our challenge. Tonight, this may be a moment where knowledge has built up and you recognize it's a time for wisdom. Tonight may be a moment which you recognize you're not where you need to be with God, but you could be, and in wisdom, you could choose to be. Tonight may be a moment where you realize that it's, it's, it's never a moment to stop being a student and you're, you're ready to learn the gospel and, and to grow, and there's many things that you may bring to the conversation and build on experiences you've already had, but tonight may be the moment that you choose to follow God in a way you've never done before. Don't hold back on that. Don't hesitate on that. God's blessed you with amazing abilities and amazing opportunities. Take advantage of what God has given you. Live in it, love it, appreciate it, but use the wisdom that's there. If there's a way that we can serve you tonight, the way that we can help you tonight, the way we can support you, please let us know. If tonight's the night that you're ready to become a Christian, don't let it be almost. Let it be certain. Know and trust. Obey what God has said. If there's a way we can help you, come forward as we stand and as we sing.